And as a moderator, I'm going to um, take the liberty of asking the first question. Right. We talked about boats having souls or spirits. And I want to know, when it comes to spirits, how many bottles of wine and beer do you guys carry on every cruise? <laughs> it's all yours, sir. Not enough. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to own a boat that was built 150 years ago. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and I sailed growing up and started working on boats when I was uh, in high school and I always heard about the main schooners. So I came up here uh, in my early 20s. I was recommended up here to work on the Louis R. French and came up here and served as a mate on board for five years. And about halfway through that time, the owners uh, that I worked for asked me if I'd be interested in maybe taking over because they were interested in moving on to a different, different occupation. And I said, yeah, that sounds great. So they kind of tricked me uh, into owning a real old boat. But they left it in great shape, and I bought it. Uh, where should I go? Thing. I'll go back here. They, they uh, left the boat in great shape. They'd always put money back into it. So I bought it from them in 2004 and started running with my wife, Jenny, who might be here, but we have little kids. So they might be running around outside. But we've run it since 2004. and. Uh, out of Camden, and we just run uh, chartered windjammer trips from Camden to Camden. This is a very rare trip for us to uh, have to have a destination trip. When we arrived yesterday, we had passengers that got on in Camden, and they just got off uh, yesterday morning, and we're going to load up some new passengers tomorrow, and then leave Tuesday morning. Uh, we're not too far away from where we normally sail, which is Penobscot Bay, Jericho Bay, Blue Hill Bay, Frenchman's Bay. Uh, but it's a different world. We don't actually come down this way uh, more than once or twice a summer. And we certainly don't come into Christmas Cove and go dockside. So it's really fun for us uh, to come in here and meet a whole bunch of people that have a history with the boat and that uh, have, have some knowledge about the boat and have knowledge about the area. So we keep adding little tidbits of history to the, to the boat. Of course, she's just a simple working schooner. Um, Throughout her life, she carried all sorts of different cargoes. But uh, slowly, as more newspapers get digitized and we can search things, we're uncovering more and more information about what she might have been doing at a certain time and where she was home ported. So uh, that part's really fun for us. And with the 150th year, we've uncovered a lot of new stuff, which has really been great to try to piece together her her whole life and what she was doing and how this simple, really small little schooner has somehow survived the economics and uh, storms and uh, uh, the, the pandemics, maybe a couple pandemics now. Uh, so uh, for now, the windjammer trade is a pretty good trade in terms of people still like doing it. And I think as long as uh, tourists still come and go sailing on the boat, she could she can continue to pay her own way, which is the hardest thing on a, on a wooden boat. Is, is keeping ahead of it, as probably many of you guys know, keeping ahead of the maintenance and not letting the boat get past that tipping point, which is amazing, both while sailing the tipping point and the uh, tipping point of, of the wood and the construction of the boat. So I'd be happy to take any any questions or anything at all. Yes? How many crew do you have? She asked how many crew. So the Coast Guard determines our entire everything, how many passengers we can take, how many crews. So I sail, including myself, with a crew of five, uh, two in the galley, and two on deck, and then myself, and we can take 20 passengers. Technically, we can take more than that, but that's how much room we have for cabins. Yeah? Uh, because of COVID, I'm sure you had a year off. Yes. Did you get some help with PPP loans to Absolutely. Yeah, we did not sail at all last year. Um, we uh, we spent a long time getting the boat ready and sort of wondering if we were going to sail, but it became clear that that was not going to work. And so, yeah, we got the PVP loans twice, and then we also got a grant from the state of Maine 
uh, to help us with all the overhead of the boat. So that helped our family tremendously in order to just stay above the overhead of the boat. So um, that was a strange summer. That's the first summer I've spent on land in 25 years. And uh, Maine's pretty nice, actually. <laughs> Lots to do during a pandemic. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us, with regard to maintenance, um, when do you try to stay with the spirit of the 1871 construction, and when, in, in, in what sense is, is it impractical, you know, sales and so forth? Right. Um, we try to make everything look exactly like it would be in 1871, but our sales, for instance, are made of Dacron. They look like canvas, they feel like canvas, they're made by Nat Wilson Sailmaker uh, in East Booth Bay. Um, but they're about only two thirds of the weight of a canvas sail and they last about 15 years versus shorter than that, they don't stretch as much. So it's a lot of stuff like that. We don't use manila line anymore for safety. Um, we're able to do some repairs using epoxy and glue that uh, well, they wouldn't be able to do even 30 years ago, we were able to repair spars, we wanted to build an entire new spar if there's a little bit of a rot spot. So there's a lot of technology that we use, but it's always about keeping the boat looking and feeling like it, like it historically did. So our deck is still traditionally laid, cocked and pitched. The hull is all oak and pine. Uh, the only non-native main wood we have on the whole boat are the masts, which came from Oregon. They're pressure treated Douglas fir. Um, she would have had pine mass, or she had pine mass for most of her life. Uh, so it's a mix, it's a mix of safety and uh, economics. And um, but it's important for me, especially with the historic part of the boat, is to is to keep her looking and feeling like like the Louis R. French. So I would never, I would heavens, I would never fiberglass anything on there. Don't worry. <laughs> Yes. Are, are there any uh, design flaws about the book? Are things that you really don't like? And what's something you really like or that surprises you? That surprises me. Right. Things I don't like about the No, I won't. Um, she's really, the things I love about the boat is how it sails, and that's probably why it survived through the years. She's very handy, and she, she does what you want her to do. Uh, when you turn the wheel, she, she turns. Some boats are more, they're more of a dog and they don't want to tack or they won't jive when you want them to, but the French is a very handy, quick boat. Um, and that uh, isn't what you get used to. Uh, design flaws, I honestly have never even thought about that. Uh, I'd like a hot tub in my cabin. <laughs> and we could maybe add that, but. No, she's just, she's a great boat, I mean she, to me, it's, she was built to do something, which is carry cargo, and, and now we've changed it to carry passengers. So are there giant beams that you hit your head on in some of the cabins? Absolutely. Um, that's part of what the boat is. So to change those things, it's, it's certainly way overbuilt for what we do. We don't need a three inch deck. We don't need six inch double sawn frames, but that's how the boat was, and that's how we try to replace all that wood in kind to keep that tradition going. And it makes her extremely stout, which is great. How much of it uh, is she original? <laughs> People always ask that. So in the 1970s, she was uh, still going down to Lubeck as a sardine carrier. And a fellow bought her and wanted to put her into the windjammer trade. And he hauled her out and blew back on the tide and he took an auger bit and he drilled into her in about 20 spots to see how she was. And he, he said, ah, she's, she's still, all of her, her frames are still good. Then he, started, he brought her down to Rockland, started taking her apart and he said, I must have drilled into the only 20 good spots on the whole boat. <laughs> so he had to do more than he wanted to. The, about two thirds of the keel, the wooden keel is still original. And there's a set of frames in the stern uh, that are still original. The rest of the boat is 
almost up, been replaced probably twice. They had a major rebuild in the 1920s, and then again in this the rebuild of turn into schooner. So um, to put a percentage on it, maybe 10% of the boat is original wood, and it's all down low in this cold salt water stuff. All the stuff on deck has been replaced for sure. Let me let me ask the other spirit question. Most of the boat has been rebuilt, but it has their spirit and changed in any way. <laughs> um, I, I've been on the boat for about 20, almost 25 years now, and there's something special about, about the boat. Uh, there are people that return to it long, who've been coming back and see the boat long before even I started. So there, there's something that draws people in to, to the boat. It's a nice size. It's a, it's a manageable boat. It's not so large that it makes people intimidated by its whole operation. So the old Louis our friend, she just has something. She just has something out there. Yeah. Do you have an engine? Do I have? Do you have an engine on the boat? No, there's no engine on the boat. She's yellow powered. So what that means is we have a little. I brought it over here uh, to come over. But a little 13-foot, uh, what we call a yaw boat, has an 85 horsepower engine in it, and that pushes us on the stern. So that's our only uh, our only means of propulsion other than the wind. It works great to get in and out of harbors. It would not be something that we'd want to use for a long voyage if you need to rely on the engine. But with what we do, as soon as we leave Camden or leave Christmas Cove, we take what the wind gives us. So. If we make one knot, we make one knot. If we make 10 knots, we make 10 knots. Um, originally, the boat probably would not have had a yaw boat. It would have added some sort of gasoline yaw boat to her. Probably around 1900, they became more popular. Like I said, ours is an 85 horsepower. A lot of the engines they added in the early 1900s were 15, 10 horsepower engines. So they were really just for getting them out of the harbor and not for not to really rely on for a long trip. So follow on to the previous question. Uh, I admired your coming in yesterday uh, with your power assist. But my uh, question was to what extent is there communication uh, between you at the helm and the guy at the elbow? <laughs> You know, you got to be coordinated, but how, how do you make it work? Yeah, well, I tell the, the person in the yaw boat, and uh, often it's our, our cook that we put in the yaw boat, um, <laughs> because I want the deckhands on deck for lines. So it's sort of like being in an engine room of a big boat. You don't look around and make any decisions, pretend you can't see. So they just look at me, and we have a, a series of signals for engine power and for what, where I want the boat angled. And they um, they just do that. So the downfall of the yaw boat is that it needs two people, and you need to communicate well to do that. The upside is that I can angle that propeller 90 degrees to the schooner and really spin. Um, so we are able to come in. I, another boat wouldn't be able to come in and spin around that green power boat. I don't know if it's someone in this room, but I didn't touch you. I can't. <laughs> Uh, to spin around there, we can angle and spin it our own length, so that allows us to come in. We do the same thing in Camden, so that move is a move that we do uh, almost every week, that high spin, and then put her on a dock like that. So uh, it takes communication, it takes practice, and we practice out in the, in the bay before we do those things, but um, you get kind of used to it, actually. <laughs> Way back. Oh, 10, 10 and a half. If we had gone up today and gone down east, we'd be doing 10, 10 and a half all the way up the coast. It'd be ideal today's breeze. Getting off the dock and getting out of Christmas Cove <laughs> against that wind would be hard on our yellow boat. I don't even know if, if she could stem that 
uh, at the very beginning here while we put on sales. But once we got them on and we're going, she would love this breeze. 20, 25, she really, on a beam reach is absolutely ideal, or broad reach, she really goes. So it's all about the length, you know, the hull speed. That's about our whole speed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So the ballast, um, when she was rebuilt in the 1970s, the schooner did not have any ballast because she was ballasted with cargo uh, until that point. So the Coast Guard uh, gets involved to make sure the boats are stable for passengers. So there's 18 tons of lead. Uh, 13 tons are bolted uh, off as a keel. So she's deeper than she was in 1871. We're seven and a half feet down, uh, bolted to the original wooden keel, and then the remaining lead is in 50 pound ingots in the in the bilges so that's why we can carry those topsails and uh, she will heal over enough to get water on the deck uh, but then she'll sort of just stay right there at about 13 degrees or so uh, what did they do back when they couldn't get out of the tight harbor in the old days uh, it was all about the owner some of them would just more than likely just sit and wait, sit and wait for the fair breeze, or you don't get yourself into that position because you know it's going to blow, so you're anchored out. But you'll see pictures, of, of, of certainly in the city, big cities, of all these boats waiting to leave with their mainsails up. They're all waiting. You see them in Booth Bay Harbor has a few pictures like that. They're all just waiting for the fair breeze to be able to fetch out of the harbor. Um, back in the 80s, 1980s, I was part of that sort of school trade and stuff. I actually sailed quite a bit with the person you purchased the boat from, they are very good friends of mine. Um, mm -hmm. But I just remember having you know, charts all over the place. So I'm just going to ask you, do you rely mostly on the charts or do you just like, oh, heck, I'm just going to use my GPS? What do you, right. what do, you, what do, you do? Well, I do both. Yeah. I, I was originally a chart person, and so I always have a chart out. Um, but the GPS is so great because you can zoom in and out. You can have every scale that you want. So the chart plotter is a wonderful tool. It, sometimes people think, oh, you cheat. I say, no, I survive. <laughs> you know, I want the radar, and I want the depth sounder, and I want the, the, the plotter. Um, they're such reliable tools now. So we have everything, but the chart is great, too, and it's always out, and it gets a much bigger picture. I usually have the GPS zoomed in and then the chart out for the people, our guests, and our crew to see the big picture of what we're doing. We're tapping down the bay here, so. I saw the wood stove in the galley. Yeah. Do you use it, and how old is it? Uh, that's a, a home clarion, and we researched that piece. Yes, we do use it. That's how we cook all the meals. All of them. All of them, Oof. yeah. Uh, we don't have any other stove on there, and then that's how the hot water's heated through a jacket to a hot water tank. Uh, that stove, the last year they built that stove was 1919. So, but it's the most popular uh, home wood cook stove that they have. I have a whole other one in my barn that we take pieces off that I bought off of Craigslist. And that's pretty classic for us. We, so I'm sort of tying it back to the historic question. We try to get historic pieces on the boat, even if they weren't from the Lewis or French. So our anchor, windless we call it, that would be so hand cranked the anchor, that's off of another schooner that was, uh, the previous owner salvaged that piece from a schooner in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, things like that we try to do. But yeah, we have two down there in the galley and they do everything on that wood cook stove, which is not gimbaled, right? So we have big fiddles around it to keep it from going, but um, the cook's job is a tough one. It's a tough one down there, but uh, we, we have this motto, if there's a harder way to do it, we do it that way. <laughs> I'm curious, in the time you've been in the windjammer industry, are there more boats, less boats? What kind of changes have you seen? And I'm curious also, of the current fleet, what other windjammer is the most similar to the French? 
Mm -hmm. um, the change I've seen in the book, there's less books now. Some of them, um, none of them have uh, uh, fallen apart or are no longer with us, but they change what they do. And, and the new thing that a lot of people do is day sales. And the wind, we think of the wind generator trip as being overnight longer trips. So they moved to Portland to do day sales. You might see the timber wind down there now. Um, that's one change, and the other change is that we do shorter trips. We used to only do long trips, and now we do all sorts of trips, three-day, four-day, five-day uh, trips. So that's, that's the biggest change that I've seen. Um, wait, what was the second part of your question? I'm uh, wondering what are the schooners is the most other schooners oh, yeah. that are similar. There's two that are similar. The Stephen Tabor was also built in 1871. Uh, but she wasn't launched till September. Critical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, she was built in Long Island. So she's a very similar looking boat. She's a little wider, but she's the same length. Um, and then the other one that's somewhat similar, but a little bit bigger, is the Mercantile, which was built in Maine, in Deer Isle. Uh, as a car they were both built as cargo schooners. Uh, she was built in 1916. But a lot of the schooners in our fleet were cargo carrying boats. We found that that's the better one for a passenger, wider, more comfortable that way, versus a deep V-bottom, like a Grand Bank schooner. There are some in the fleet, but they're, they have a lot of room, but it's all, they're narrower. And that, uh, for passenger, comfort is harder. So most of the boats were old cargo schooners in our fleet. Uh, are you aware at any point in the Lewis R. Francis history from 1871 to the present of any disasters or near disasters from which she recovered? Yes, quite a few. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is all from different newspaper articles that we've read, that we've had sent to us. But yeah, there's several times when she was pulled off the rocks uh, after gales. Um, there was a fire on board in Belfast that sunk her at the dock with a load of bricks uh, on board. So, uh, yeah, she's the thing. She'll say, "Why did this boat survive, where all the other ones did not?" And it's 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 luck. There's a it's a combination. There's some luck involved, and uh, you know, if, we, if you guys are all sailors, you all know that. I think we've probably all been over a rock that if the tide was down another foot, we would have hit it, but we've skimmed over it. So there's things like that where you just realize the boat has just survived by, um, by statistically very low chance of it making it. So, but never a disaster enough to totally uh, condemn it. So, uh, which is probably a statement back to her, her capabilities on the water. Even when she was a sardine carrier, so sometime in the late 1920s, they took out the mast and, and powered her. Uh, and, the, and, and then she was owned by an uh, American canning company down in Lubeck, in Eastport. Uh, they also spoke very highly of her in terms of her capabilities in the water. Like she never, the captain said, she never shipped any water. So even driving down against the waves down to Boston, that she was a very dry boat. So. She was worth putting money back into to keep her going. How are your bookings this year compared to pre-pandemic? This will be our best year we've ever had, actually. <laughs> and that's a combination of all the people that canceled last year who uh, were kind enough to keep their deposits with us, which helped us with cash flow. And now they all signed up, plus all of the, you know, Suddenly, people were ready to go. <laughs> They're ready to do some things. So, and that's across the board for the fleet. It all seems like that. And then we often talk to bed and breakfasts and things like that. And they all uh, in Camden are extremely busy this year. So, and Maine is going to have a very busy, busy summer. <laughs> do you guys feel the same down here? You feel you feeling that? Yeah. And the way back. Do you know what? That's always that's the story that we've always heard is that the that the lines for the boat came from a half model that someone probably whittled up. There's several other boats uh, from the area in this time frame uh, that were built down here that are very similar. 
lines to her. So uh, that's the idea. There's certainly not a, it's very doubtful that there was an architect that, that drew it all up and, and um, you know, presented it in that way. I can shed a tiny amount of light on that. Um, Menzies Gamage, who was the designer of a number of boats, we actually, we actually, I've seen half models with information on the back. Um, not the French, you know, I think we'd all give our left arms and part of our right arms to have, a, have the original half model from the French. I, I'm sure it was probably taken from another boat and stretched and done as they did. Yeah, I agree. Who else? Anybody else? All right. Yeah, just one more. Is, it, is she a, uh, like a cash flow break even endeavor, or does she generate excess reserves to for <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it, it all depends on how many people we have on the boat, how many passengers we get on the boat. But, um, the revenues are enough to keep her going uh, year after year. If she needed a full rebuild, at, if we fell behind and she needed a full rebuild, meaning like gutter, uh, the, the wind generator business probably would be difficult to finance that. But if you're just maintaining, uh, the boat does survive. So, you know, it pays for my family and it, the family that I bought it from it paid for uh, as well. So it's a little, Pretty classic main business that's up and down. But I'm looking for investors now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering, are um, all of your berths filled for the summer? I mean, how's it looking for you? Are you just like out straight and you can't take any more reservations? Almost, yeah, and that's kind of rare. Usually there's space, spaces. This, this year is especially busy. My wife does the reservations. She said we have a few births in September, which is crazy and great. Um, usually we'll have space throughout. The summer is very busy no matter how many people are on. If there, we take 20, if there's only 10 that have signed up, we still go, of course, and do it. So it's kind of all the same. For me, I'm out there no matter what. To have 20 is great. And uh, like I said, it's the whole fleet, only two boats ran in our, in our little fleet last year and they didn't have very many people. So our whole fleet needed a little injection uh, and I, this year should, should be good for it. Uh, I can talk a long time now. <laughs> we'll, we'll do, I got one more, I guess. Do either of you guys know who the actual builder was? Right. Yeah. I mean, we wish we did. There's information. So when the boat was rebuilt in the 1970s, uh, the guy who was doing the rebuild attracted a lot of attention. He was doing it up in Rockland. And the French family, headed by Ruby French, uh, who I believe was the postmistress down here, she supplied a lot of information orally about what, where the boat was built, who built it, um, and some of that doesn't exactly jive with some of the other information we've had. So I always stuck with, and then I was passed on that story, that Ruby French said the boat was built right over here in Christmas Cove, and I believe that. I believe that she was correct and that the damaged yard sent workers down and they built it right down here. So that, that's the sort of, will we ever get to the bottom of that? Not unless we find another piece of paper somewhere or a photograph, but uh, we credit her with that. The National Park Service, which did us a national, uh, deemed us a National Historic Landmark, I believe she was building Christmas Cove. So uh, she certainly wanted to come back here the other day. So I, <laughs> I think, Stan, I can say at least some of these people will. I'm very comfortable saying that. That's, that's the boat builders who sell in Bristol. Yeah, Farrer, the, John Farrer and his brother James Farrer, I assume brother, but maybe not, um, are definitely are listed, um, not on anything official, but anecdotally, as the head carpenter and the blacksmith who built the boat. And one of the Farrer brothers does show up as a one-eighth owner 
in the very original document. I think it's just John. Yeah, it's John. It's so he may have he may have worked for one eighth or invested in the boat as well. Why didn't they? Why didn't they? I just want to say thank you. I, this has been really fun for us to come down here and meet uh, a bunch of people, and certainly meet some of the French family that uh, that um, are still around and. I, I, it's really neat just to be in a kind of a different place, and uh, and our guests loved it, and everyone, and you guys have been so nice to us. So thank you very much for for hosting us here. Yeah.